We are finishing a sermon series today called The Story, God's Message of Hope. I have really enjoyed hearing some of the stories found in the Old Testament, and I secretly wish that the Power Boys could always act out the scripture for us like they did last week all the time. If you have not had a chance to watch last week's worship, check it out. We all have a story. The same God who revealed himself through stories created people like you and me who learn best through stories with all of our highs and lows. Our stories interlock in so many ways, just like the pieces of these Legos, our stories connect. My grandson can make these Legos into all kinds of interesting creations, but the pieces have to fit together in a certain way in order for them to become a masterpiece. Legos in a basket or a bucket are just that, just a bunch of individual pieces, but put together, they are much more. Before we begin to dive into this story, let's pray. Gracious and holy God, may we be met by you today. May your Holy Spirit wash over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Ananias' story is found in the greater story of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Their stories are connected. And in this connection, we see the beauty of God's greater story. So to understand Ananias' story, we have to understand Paul's story. So let's go back to the beginning. The ninth chapter of Acts begins this way. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, for those who might not know this, Saul would go on to become the Apostle Paul. But at this time in his life, he is Saul of Tarsus. And the name of Saul of Tarsus struck fear into the hearts of the early Christian community. Saul was fanatical in his hatred for those who followed Jesus Christ, collecting the cloaks of those who he helped execute. We hear first of Saul back in chapter 7 at the stoning of Stephen, the first of those who are martyred for the Christian faith. The story of his death ends with this. The witnesses placed their coats in the care of a young man named Saul. Saul at this time is part of those who are persecuting those who follow Jesus as those who blaspheme the name of God. He is basically out hunting Christians and having them arrested. As we heard, Saul is headed toward Damascus to do that very thing when Jesus calls him to change his direction. It says this, Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So he led them by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Saul is blind, alone and waiting for the Lord to reveal the next chapter in his story. And when Saul's eyes are opened, he is going to see the world differently. Maybe that has happened to you too. Can you think back to a time in your life in which you believe something different? You had a view of people or a view of life or a view of a moral decision in a much different way than you do right now. And yet, God has placed people in your life that have helped you to see with new eyes. Or this person has helped you to understand from a different perspective. Maybe the scales have fallen from your own eyes too and you see things differently now today. How does God help us do that? He uses people, people like you and me, people like Ananias. 
It was Saul's encounter with Ananias that helped him see the connecting pieces of God's greater story. Ananias had to be willing to see Paul differently. Paul had to be willing to see Christians differently. Gaining sight was about gaining the ability to see an entire group of people as human and not as the enemy. God changed the course of history by first making people rethink their assumptions about one another as individuals and as groups. This seems like what we are realizing we need to do today too. Changing our assumptions not thinking of entire groups of people as the enemy, finding similarities instead of our differences, and not being fearful of what we do not understand. We live in a world today where our every thought and action seems to be posted for all to see. I think we're out of practice in speaking face to face with those who hold different views and beliefs. Instead, we argue our stance, post it on our blog or social media, and let the world respond. As it says in one of the books I am reading, Uncommon Ground, written by a number of authors, including Tim Keller, the ability to put ourselves in someone else's shoes requires humility. And the impetus for doing so requires patience rooted in hope and tolerance grounded in love. This is increasingly difficult at a time in which, as Sherry Turkle argues, social media and other technologies significantly reduces our ability to exercise empathy. Our personal encounters with Christ and personal encounters with the community of followers change us. We cannot stay the same if we're in relationship with God through Christ. We cannot stay the same if we are in relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We learn from each other. Now, if we go back to our story that Jennifer read for us earlier, we learn that this is where Ananias enters Saul's story. Ananias was a devout and faithful follower of Jesus. When he hears the voice of God tell him to go to Straight Street and find the man named Saul, he was a bit hesitant, you could say. I like how the common English says he countered, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man. <laughs> I can imagine he thought, say what? You want me to go find the man who kills Christians? I sometimes picture God unfolding his map and showing Ananias, straight street is here. You turn left and then you go right here. Sometimes I wish it was that easy for God to show us the way. There are two things that I can imagine that went through Ananias' mind that day. How do I know that this is the voice of Christ? I think this is a question we all ask ourselves. Is this God's voice or is it my voice? One of the tests I give myself in this is, does it align with God's word or is it something I want? Well, if we use that test with Ananias, we know that he couldn't possibly want to do this, so we can put that part out. But we also know that suffering is a part of our Christian path. We share in Christ's baptism, his suffering, his death, and in his resurrection. Ananias is not being told to tell Paul anything contrary to that. Here's what Jesus does not say to Ananias. I want you to show him what a great success he's going to have as a missionary. I want you to show him what a great name he's going to make for himself and what heights of fame he'll reach. No. What Jesus says is, I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias must have known that Christ was speaking because we know this to be the truth. And we know it is Christ speaking because we too know that truth. Suffering comes with those who follow Christ, as does love, grace, forgiveness, second chances, 
new life, all the things Ananias is being called to share with Saul. So I can imagine the next place his brain would have gone is here. What in the world is God thinking? You ever done that one? I know I have. God, why would you pick that person to do that? Don't you know what they've done? Don't you know that person, what they believe, who they are? But God, that person is, and you can fill in the blank. We all have people that we don't think should sit at our table. And we have to name that sin within us and ask for forgiveness. As I was doing some reading this week, I ran across this story that really makes this point. There was a man who was struggling desperately with alcohol. His family was just being decimated. Some friends picked him up, began to share the gospel with him. He gave his life to Christ and his life was transformed. After a while, he went back to some of his drinking buddies. He said, hey, let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done for me. And he began to share a bit about the transforming power of the gospel. One of his friends began to laugh and say, hey, don't you tell us we shouldn't drink. Nothing is wrong with drinking. Jesus turned water into wine. And the man replied, I really don't know about all that, but I do know my wife and children are impressed because in our house, Jesus Christ has turned beer into furniture. It's a rememberable story, but it illustrates a serious point. Recovery is not something that can be done alone. We need God, we need our friends, we need our community. That's the transforming power of the gospel, and it's why we have worked so hard to stay connected with one another despite the pandemic. If you are struggling with addiction, you don't have to do this alone. Stay connected. That's the transforming power of the gospel. What if the friends had never shared the gospel with him when they saw what it was doing to his family? What if they had said, God, you know what he's like. If you wanted him to be different, he would be. When all the time God was saying, but you are the one that can connect him to me. And when he does, he's going to be so transformed that you have no idea what he can do through me because he's going to share his story. You have to trust me. That is what Ananias did. He trusted Christ. Ananias comes to Saul as God commanded, and God uses him as an instrument of healing and hope to reach Saul. Ananias welcomes him as brother and lays hands on him in prayer. It is one of the most inspiring examples of Christian love found in God's story. God used Ananias to reach a blind and fearful Saul, and the scales fell from his eyes and from his heart. And Ananias offered him a new life, a new identity in Christ, and Saul becomes Paul. Ananias comes to him in faith, in hope, and in love. He comes with humility, willing to bathe him and feed him and help him grow stronger. He comes to him with patience and with tolerance because we both know that Paul probably didn't do everything right at first. We never do. <laughs> Ananias' act of love was a step along the way that helped change the world. The story of one person fits with another, and then another, and then another, when like Paul and Ananias, we allow God to open our eyes and begin to see each other differently. What's your story? How can God use your story within the greater story of God's love? 
The Christian calling is to be shaped and reshaped, interlocked and built for the kingdom. We are to be a people whose every thought and action is guided by faith, by hope and by love. And then who speak and act in the world around us with humility, with patience, and yes, with tolerance. In fact, with Christ, we can do far more than tolerate, though. Jesus does not say tolerate each other, does he? He commands us to love one another just as he loves us and to forgive one another just as he forgives us. Just think what all the pieces of Christ's kingdom could do if we were connected together. What a masterpiece of love that would be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I pray this. Amen.